Good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to our fifth lesson in our Bible class on the intertestamental period that we're doing here on Facebook Live. We've been doing this now on Thursday evenings, uh, well, for five weeks. This is our fifth week to do this, and we're going to be continuing to do this uh, for the foreseeable future as long as there's interest and people are tuning in. Last week, we had some questions that were asked in the course of the class. I hope that we'll have some of those questions asked this evening as well. Um, again, this is our fifth lesson this evening. We're going to be talking about the collapse of Alexander's empire. Uh, we've got a lot of historical ground to cover in these opening lessons of this series before we can get into some other things that are more topical uh, that come out of this period of the intertestamental period. Of course, we're talking about that period of time that stretches from the end of the Old Testament to the beginning of the New Testament. We kind of expand that a little bit when, when we did this class. Um, for the purposes of this class, we expanded that a little bit to go all the way back to the Babylonian Empire. And we're going to continue on into the Roman period as well and into the first century. So it's the intertestamental period expanded some to include some other information. And again, tonight we're talking about the collapse of Alexander's empire. If you were not with us last week, you may have missed a lot of that information. The video is available on our YouTube channel, and I believe that you can get that off of Facebook as well. So if you didn't get to uh, tune in for that and you'd, like, and you'd like to do that, go ahead and tune into that on YouTube or here on Facebook. All of those videos are archived and you can have a look and a listen at those. So pretty much at the end of our class last week, we got to the point of Alexander's death. And so we're going to just repeat a little bit of that information um, to kind of get us going this evening. Of course, when we talk about Alexander the Great, we, we remember that he had built the largest empire that had ever existed up until his time in that part of the world. His empire was larger uh, than the Assyrian Empire, it was larger than the Babylonian Empire, it was larger than the Persian Empire. Uh, it was the largest empire that had ever existed in that part of the world up until that point in time. And he had carved out that empire in a very short period of time. Uh, we remember that last week we talked about the fact that Alexander died in Babylon in 323 BC. He was very, very young uh, after having built this empire. Uh, he then dies, and there's a lot of questions historically about whether he died of natural causes or whether he was poisoned. That's a question that uh, historians are going to argue about probably for a very, very long time and never come up with a conclusive answer to that. But the long and short of it was when Alexander died, he left no clear successor, and he left no plans for how his empire was going to be ruled. And of course, that is going to be a major problem because he carves out this huge empire. He spends virtually all of his time up until the time he dies conquering new territory. And then when he dies, what's going to happen with all this territory that he's conquered? Who's going to rule it? Who's going to take his place? How is it going to be administered and ruled? And that's a major problem when you have a major empire like that. And, it, and the leader of that empire uh, dies, falls apart, and the empire then has to do something with that. The generals that served under Alexander, who served as representatives of the Macedonian nation, uh, have a meeting to decide the future. They're going to have to decide what they're going to do with this incredibly large empire. I've got a map there for you to see just to get an idea for how incredibly large this empire was that Alexander conquered. Of course, it stretches all the way from the west there, Greece, Macedonia, Thrace. It, it sweeps through Asia Minor. It sweeps through Palestine all the way down through uh, Mesopotamia, across into Persia, and then off as far east as India. Of course, we don't leave Egypt out of that. Egypt is a part of that empire as well. So you've got this incredibly large empire, and the ruler and the conqueror has died. So the Macedonian generals get together to kind of decide, well, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do with this work that has been built? How are we going to keep this together? What are we going to do uh, to administer this empire. Well, there were some potential successors. So the generals had some options on the table, some things that they could uh, potentially put into place for ruling, this, um, for ruling this empire. One of the first uh, options they had was to put a man whose name was Aridaeus. Aridaeus was Alexander's brother. And so Aridaeus came from the royal family. He was close to Alexander. He potentially could have been placed on the throne in Alexander's place. The problem with Aridaeus was, first, he was illegitimate, second, he was epileptic, and thirdly, he was considered mentally unfit. So 
you know, the generals are presented with this option and they understand that if this guy is going to be king, we're going to have some, we're going to have some difficulties that we're going to have to overcome for him to take that place of Alexander. Another possibility, uh, another potential successor after Alexander was someone we're just going to call a question mark. He's a question mark at this point in time. He won't be a question mark later. But at this point in time, when Alexander dies, Alexander's wife, Roxana, who's a Bactrian princess, is actually pregnant with his child. And so certainly another possibility is, well, we've got this baby that's going to be born, and it's possible that this baby could then take over uh, in Alexander's place. Of course, that's going to involve some regencies and some other things, because he certainly is a newborn, not able to rule an empire. So that's certainly one possibility. A third possibility involved... Uh, a child whose name was Heracles. Heracles was Alexander's three-year-old son. Uh, Heracles' mother was a former concubine. And, of course, Heracles was not of full Macedonian blood. So that's going to be that's gonna be a couple of check marks against him in looking at this process. So we've got Aridaeus, we've got question mark, we've got Heracles as potential successors. What are we going to do? Well, there was a fourth option that was on the table, and that is that there would be collective rule, that these generals would form a group that would then make decisions for the empire. So rather than there being a king as such, a single ruler, there would be a committee that would rule the empire. So they had these potential, they had these possibilities in front of them uh, that they could look at and decide, well, what's going to work best for taking care of this empire that Alexander had carved out? So what followed on this after this meeting or as a result of this meeting is what's called the Babylonian Settlement. And as a result of the Babylonian Settlement or in the Babylonian Settlement, I should say, there's a general whose name is Perdiccas. He becomes regent. He becomes regent for Aridaeus. Aridaeus is given the name, the royal name, King Philip III. Roxana, in the meantime, remember that's that Bactrian princess, gives birth to a son, that son becomes King Alexander IV. But of course, neither Aridaeus nor Alexander IV are able to actually rule. So General Perdiccas is going to become regent. He's going to be the one who's ruling in their name. Well, what about the other generals? Well, as a result or as a part of the Babylonian settlement then, other generals become satraps or governors. And so they're going to be given different parts of the empire to rule, Perdiccas is going to be taking care of Aridaeus and Alexander IV, but in reality, he's going to be ruling. Well, I've got to tell you, if you're looking at that and you're thinking, well, these are all generals, and generals are, uh, generally speaking, they are the quintessential alpha male. Uh, they don't always play together nicely. So you might be looking at this and you might be saying, well, this is a recipe for disaster. And indeed, Indeed, it really was, because what's going to follow on the heels of this Babylonian settlement is a series of wars that are going to rend Alexander's empire apart. So Alexander builds this incredible empire, and then basically on his death, that empire is just going to fall apart, and it's going to do so in a very bloody way. These wars that follow the Babylonian settlement are called, historically, the Diadoc Wars, and that comes from that funny word, Diadoc, comes from the Greek word that means successors. So it's these wars that are going to take place among these successors to Alexander, to Alexander the Great. The first of those wars is fought in 322 to 320 BC, and it is called the First Diadoc War. Not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. In fact, not going to say anything more about that, except to say that you see very, very quickly. I mean, Alexander dies in 323, and immediately in 322, we have war already going on. Peace is signed, peace is settled in 320, doesn't last very long because then the second Diadoc War breaks out in 318 and it lasts till 315 BC. So the second Diadoc War follows only two years of peace, it's going to last three years. In the course of this war, Philip Aridaeus is executed. That's in December of 317 BC. So if you remember that slide where we talked about those potential successors, well, we just lost one because Aridaeus is now dead. He's not going to rule anything. In the course of this war as well, Olympias, who is Alexander's mother, is executed in 316 BC. So already in the Second Diadoc War, you see that some people that would have been very, very close to Alexander had Alexander been alive, actually end up losing their lives. Both of these two individuals are executed. Well, 
The peace is concluded in 315. The Second Diadoc War ends. Doesn't last very long because then in 314 BC, we get the start of the Third Diadoc War and it's gonna go till 311 BC. This particular war, this Third Diadoc War, is ended in a peace treaty. The treaty dictates that Alexander IV, remember that is the son who had not yet been born when Alexander died, Roxana is his mother. Alexander IV is gonna be given the kingdom in 305 BC. So the treaty that ends this war says, okay, Alexander's too young right now to get the kingdom, but in 305 BC, we'll give him the kingdom. He'll be able to rule. That would have put him, if my math is correct, and I'm doing this really, really quickly, but if my math is correct, that would have made him about 17, 18 years old and able to then take over the kingship. So that's the term of the treaty. Now, what ends up happening with this is that in 309 BC, Alexander IV, that's the fellow that was supposed to get the throne, and Roxana, that's his mother, are murdered secretly because Cassander, who is one of Alexander the Great's generals, was simply unwilling to give up power. He's got a lot of power. He understands that in 305, Alexander IV is going to get the throne. He's not going to have the power that he's had up till now. We're going to solve that. We're going to murder Alexander IV and Roxana in a secret way before this even becomes an issue. Well, you can imagine that that's not going to set very well among the successors. And so following on the third Diadoc War, we have the fourth Diadoc War, and that goes from 307 to 301 BC. This is the last of the Diadoc Wars. And after this war, there are going to be three empires that actually end up replacing Alexander's empire. There is the Antigonid Kingdom that's centered in Macedonia. It is very small, not particularly relevant for our purposes in this class. I'm not saying it's not important historically. It's not important for what we're doing in these classes. And so we're just going to kind of gloss over them. That is one of the three empires that's going to emerge when the dust settles from all of these wars. The other two are the Ptolemaic Kingdom in Egypt and the Seleucid Kingdom in Asia. Both of these kingdoms are going to be very important for subsequent Jewish history. And so we're going to focus our attention this evening on dealing with the Ptolemies and the Seleucids and how they're going to deal with the Jews. Let's pull up a map again. Uh, this basically is very similar to the one we've already seen, but it shows how things end up after these Diadoc Wars. And so I'm just going to point out some things here um, with a pointer. If you'll just look in the highlighted section, maybe if I can get it to cooperate. Hang on, just there we go. If you'll just look up here, this area up here, this is the Antigone Kingdom, that darker orange. These purple areas are Hellenistic provinces. Um, so that kingdom up there and that area up there, we're not going to talk about. They're not important for us this evening. Then we have this very, very large section of blue. That's the Seleucid Kingdom, and it is centered in Asia. Then down here in Egypt and in Palestine, in this green area, we have the Ptolemaic Kingdom. That's the other kingdom that's going to be important for our purposes this evening. But I want you to notice that the border between the dark blue area and the green area stretches right across the area of Palestine. Specifically, the line is drawn here at this point in time, right around Damascus. This area is going to be a border area between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, and it's going to be an area that's going to be contested for many, many years. So let's talk a little bit about battleground Palestine. Again, Palestine forms that border area between the, the, between the Ptolemies in Egypt and the Seleucids in Asia. The Jews, of course, live in Palestine. They're living in Judea or Judah, and they're going to find themselves first under the control of one and then the other. And although it is contested ground, the Jews are going to be mostly, well, not mostly, they're going to be entirely under Ptolemaic control until about 198 BC. And so even though this is a contested battlefield area, this area in general, Palestine, they're at least going to be under the rule of the kingdom that's centered in Egypt until 198 BC. Sometimes, Sometimes we look at ourselves today and we say, well, we're living in interesting days and we certainly are living in interesting days. And there's a lot of debate about how all that's supposed to work and what we should be doing. But I got to tell you, 
things today aren't nearly as interesting as they would have been for Jews during this period. This was a terrible time, by and large, for the Jews. There's going to be warfare going back and forth. There's going to be armies going back and forth. They're going to find themselves under one ruler. Then they're going to find themselves under another ruler. And the rulers of the two kingdoms were often very different in their outlook. So we're going to look at the Jews first, how they fared under the Ptolemies, that are based in Egypt because they're under their control until 198 BC. So the Ptolemaic kingdom, let's just say this, lasted until 30 BC, okay? In 30 BC, it becomes a Roman province. The Romans are very interested in Egypt. They're very interested in Egypt because they're expanding their empire. The rise of Rome is going to be a subject for a later class, but Egypt is going to be very, very important because Egypt Egypt produces grain. It produces a lot of grain. And so the Romans are going to be very interested about what's going on in Egypt because they're getting grain from Egypt. And that's going to be a situation that continues well into the New Testament period. So it lasts until 30 BC when it becomes a Roman province. There were 14 kings in this dynasty. They were all called Ptolemy. But then they were given nicknames. So every one of these kings is called Ptolemy and then some other name after that. Women also were very prominent in this dynasty, including seven queens who were named Cleopatra and four who were named Berenice. Now, we're probably familiar with one of those Cleopatras because we remember the Hollywood movie that's got her in there. At least a lot of older folks will remember that Hollywood movie. People know about Cleopatra and Mark Antony and Julius Caesar and all of that. Well, that's one of the Cleopatras. It's the last of the Cleopatras. There were six before her, as well as four that had the name Berenice, which we also see uh, later in New Testament history. But there are these very prominent women. In fact, what's interesting about this dynasty is that many of these queens were actually their husband's sisters. So there was a lot of inbreeding, if you will, in this dynasty. But these women would have been very, very important because they were not only the queen, they were also of the royal family by birth. So let's look on a little bit more at this. And I'm just looking, I'm just looking over here at my partner, uh, Ivana, who is following the comments so that if you have any questions, you can write those in the comments and she'll let me see those. All right, so let's talk about a little bit more about the Ptolemies and how the Jews fared under them. Hellenization was not a major concern of this dynasty. We talked last week about Hellenization and what that was. Hellenization was the idea that everything Greek was superior to everything else. You may remember we had a quote last week where Aristotle told Alexander, when you deal with fellow Greeks, treat them like brothers. When you deal with barbarians, that is people who are not Greeks, Treat them like you would an animal or a plant. Everything Greek was considered superior in every way. And so Hellenization was this idea that we are going to spread Greek culture. We are going to spread Greek language. We're going to get people to really understand how, how valuable uh, all of this Greek stuff is. Well, the Ptolemies in Egypt weren't particularly concerned about that. The result of that being that the Jews under the Ptolemies were generally afforded freedom and leniency during this period. Not all the time, but generally they were because the Ptolemies didn't really care who the Jews were worshiping. They didn't really care who the Jews, uh, what, what language the Jews were speaking. They didn't really care whether the Jews adopted all of that Greek culture. They weren't all that concerned about that. One of the kings that is important for our purposes this evening is a fellow whose name was Ptolemy I. He's the first in that dynasty. His nickname is Soter. He reigns from 306 to 282 BC, and it's, uh, it is this individual that in 312 BC captures Jerusalem. Okay, So that's going to put Jerusalem into this kingdom's orbit. He settled 100,000 Jews in Alexandria, including 30,000 men who were armed and settled in garrisons. I want, to just un I want us to understand this, how important this is. We, we talked last class about Alexander founding the city of Alexandria as a Greek city there in Egypt. Ptolemy I, he brings 100,000 Jews to Alexandria and settles them there, in addition to all the other people that are already living there. Among those 100,000 are 30,000 men who are armed and settled 
in garrisons. So this is the beginning of a significant Jewish presence and population in the city of Alexandria. And that's going to be very, very important. These Jews in Alexandria are going to be very influential in some things that we're going to talk about later that's going to, that are going to involve the translation of the Old Testament into Greek, which is very important for New Testament studies. We'll get to that in a later class. Let's continue on and note some other things about Jews in, under this dynasty. We also have Ptolemy II Philadelphus, that's his nickname. He reigns from 282 to 246 BC. Historically, we are told that he ordered the translation of the Old Testament into Greek. We remember up until this point in time, the Old Testament has been written in Aramaic, well, primarily Hebrew, and also some portions in Aramaic. Well, Greek people are not really speaking uh, much Hebrew or Aramaic. So he orders this translation from the Old Testament into Greek. It was supposed to be placed, this translation was supposed to be placed in the library of Alexandria. Again, this center where there were so many Jews that had been settled and it was a Greek city there in Egypt. Uh, our next king that's important, we're, we're skipping a little bit of time here. We get to Ptolemy V Epiphanes. That's his nickname. He reigns from 205 to 180 BC. He is defeated in the Battle of Peneus in 198 BC. As a result of that defeat, he loses control of Palestine to the Seleucid Kingdom. So it is Ptolemy V who loses the Jews, at least the Jews in Palestine, those folks are now going to be under the Seleucid, uh, under, under Seleucid control. I might just say this. If you're looking at that name, Peneus, and you're kind of wondering, well, where in the world is Peneus and what's that all about? We know this place in the New Testament. In the New Testament, Peneus goes by the name Caesarea Philippi, and it's located way up in the north. We remember Jesus passing through Caesarea Philippi, and he asks the disciples a question. He asks them, who do men say that I am? And they give him various answers, and he says, well, who do you say that I am? And, of course, Peter gives that great confession that Jesus was the Christ. Um, so Peneus is, that, is, is Caesarea Philippi in an earlier period by a different name. This very vital battle was fought there. It's going to put the Jews under the Seleucid kingdom. But before we get to that, let's just say some other things about how they fared. Uh, the Ptolemaic rulers generally administered Judea through the high priests. Well, for the Jews, that would have worked very well because high priests already had uh, a position of authority and a prestigious position among the people. And so uh, these Egyptian rulers ruling in that way would have worked very well. And again, it was generally, generally a period of time in which the Jews fared fairly well. Some Jews during this period, Hellenization was not a priority of the Ptolemies, but some Jews of this period were quite willing to cooperate with the Greek overlords and even pursue Hellenization. Well, this whole question of whether or not to adopt Greek culture and Greek language and all the things that go with that are going to become a real test for the Jews when they're under Seleucid control, which is going to happen after 198 BC. So let's go ahead and talk about their time under the Seleucid kingdom. The Seleucid kingdom itself lasted from just after the death of Alexander until 63 BC. So we would peg the dates there, 332 to 63 BC. This kingdom is centered in Asia. They gained control of Palestine again, as we already discussed, after the Battle of Peneus in 198. And they're going to keep control of Palestine until 142 BC. So the Jews are going to be under their rule for just just over 50 years. Let's pull up that map again to give an idea, uh, once again, of the Seleucid Empire, the Seleucid Kingdom. It is represented in dark blue here on the map. That's, as, that's at its largest extent. Of course, the border is down here. After Peneus, that, green, that line between green and blue would move all the way down uh, to include all of Judea or all of Judah, all of southern Palestine under their control. I might also point out that when we talk about the rise of Rome, we're going to see that Rome is going to sweep through this area and the Seleucids are going to lose their territory north of the Taurus Mountains. You just kind of see that in the center of that highlighted section of the map. They're going to lose all of that territory. Well, in 63 BC, they're going to lose to the Romans 
period. That's going to be topic uh, for a later discussion. So let's talk about the Jews under the Seleucids. The first individual that we should talk about is Antiochus III, the Great. That's his nickname, even though all of these guys had different names. He is the victor at Paneus, but he's defeated by Rome during the Roman-Syrian War. That's 192 to 190 BC. That's where they lose all that territory north of the Taurus Mountains. They lose basically everything in Asia Minor. Um, his son, Antiochus is the son, uh, Antiochus's son, I should say, uh, whose name is also Antiochus. Well, it will be Antiochus when he becomes king. His son, as a result of this war, is sent to Rome as a political hostage. And he's going to remain there until 177 BC. So the Romans come up against the Seleucids. The Seleucids lose. They lose territory. And the Romans say, you know what? You've got a son. We think he should go live with us in Rome. Hopefully that's going to keep you in line. It also served to teach Antiochus an awful lot about Roman power. Well, let's return to Antiochus III. He dies in Persia in 187 BC. Now, Antiochus III was generally considered friendly to the Jews. In fact, he resettled 2,000 Jewish families from Babylonia to Asia Minor. Let's read about that. Um, this is what we can read. Having been informed that a sedition has arisen in Lydia and Phrygia, I thought that matter required great care, and upon advising with my friends what was fit to be done, it has been thought proper to remove 2,000 families of Jews with their effects out of Mesopotamia and Babylon. So he doesn't take them out of Judah. He takes them out of Mesopotamia and Babylon unto the castles. This is very old English. It's an old translation. And places that lie most convenient. For I am persuaded that they will be well-disposed guardians of our possessions because of their piety towards God. And because I know that my predecessors have borne witness to them that they are faithful and with alacrity do what they are desired to do. I will, therefore, though it be a laborious work, that thou remove these Jews under a promise that they shall be permitted to use their own laws. And so Antiochus III recognizes that these Jews that are living in Mesopotamia and Babylon are quality folks. They serve well. They serve well because of their piety towards God. And so I'm going to take 2,000 families of these folks. I'm going to move them up into these garrisons, up into these fortified areas in Lydia and Phrygia, so that they can support my regime up there. I think it's an interesting comment on the relationship between this Seleucid ruler, Antiochus III, and the Jews living in his kingdom. It's an interesting contrast to what's going to happen under his son, Antiochus IV. So let's talk about him. I did indicate last class that one thing that's really interesting about this period is that we begin to get realistic, sculptures of a lot of these rulers. And so you are looking there at a sculpture of Antiochus IV. We actually know what these guys look like. We saw a sculpture last week of Alexander the Great. We're going to see some coins in just a moment as well because the coinage also would give us some realistic depictions. This is, this is fairly unique um, and when we study world history because when you go back much farther than this, you really not sure you really can't be sure that you're getting a good picture of what the individual actually looked like but the greeks were very interested in uh realistic depictions okay so antiochus the fourth antiochus the third is succeeded by seleucus the fourth who was assassinated by heliodorus in 175 bc all right so antiochus the third dies he dies in persia seleucus the fourth takes over seleucus the fourth then is assassinated by a fellow whose name was heliodorus that's on 175 BC. Antiochus IV then defeats Heliodorus and seizes the throne for himself. He seizes the throne for himself because he actually wasn't next in line for the throne. He isn't the firstborn son, okay? Uh, so Seleucus IV is dead. Antiochus IV gets rid of Heliodorus and then he takes over the throne. He just skips over who should have been the next ruler. He becomes the next king. Antiochus IV then assumed the title in Greek, Teos Epiphanes, which means God manifest. Notice up there at the top of the screen, that's his nickname. That's the title. Now the Jews, the Jews nicknamed him Epimanes, which means the madman. Because Antiochus IV, when he talks about God manifest, he's talking about himself. He considered himself deity. 
and he expected other people to consider him deity as well. Let's look at one of his coins. This is a coin it's called a tetradrachm. It is from Antiochus IV. The Greek inscription on the coin reads, King Antiochus, God manifest, that's that Theos Epiphanes, bearer of victory. And so we get on one side of the coin, um, we get on one side of the coin, the depiction of Antiochus. I assume that's Antiochus. I'm not 100% sure about that. But on the other side of the coin, we definitely get a depiction of Antiochus because the inscription tells us that. So we have Antiochus on the throne and he's holding victory. Victory was a Greek god. Nike was the Greek god. That's what he was called in Greek or what she was called in Greek. And you notice that he's this Nike, victory there, is holding that wreath, that laurel wreath. And so you've got Antiochus holding victory in his hand. He really took this whole deity thing pretty seriously. Well, Antiochus IV had a pretty unpredictable personality. He had spent 12 years in Rome as a political hostage. I'm not sure how uh, good his life was there, uh, but he had a pretty unstable and unpredictable personality. In the meantime, in Judea, Onias III, who was a very Orthodox Jew, holds the high priesthood. Now, when I talk about somebody who's an Orthodox Jew, what I mean by that is he's serious about keeping the law of God, and he's the high priest. In 174 BC, Jason, who is Onias's brother, offers a large tribute to Antiochus and purchases the high priesthood. Well, if you are a believing Jew, you understand that this is all foolish. This is all nonsense. The high priesthood is not up for sale. But if you are Antiochus IV, you don't care because you've just been offered money by somebody who wants to be the priest. Okay, you're giving me a lot of money. You can be the high priest. And so Jason, Jason gets to be high priest. Now, Jason was a committed Hellenist. You might notice that by looking at his name. His name here is a Greek name. Now, a lot of Jews later are going to have Greek names, but at this point in time in Jewish history, if they're wearing a, a Greek name, it probably says something at least about their parents' attitudes towards Hellenism. Jason was a committed Hellenist. Not only did he buy the high priesthood, but he then built a gymnasium in Jerusalem. Now, we might look at that. We might say, well, bodily exercise, that's a great thing. Everybody wants the gyms to open up right now, right? Except in a Greek context, in a gymnasium, all the boys exercise with no clothes on. No clothes on. That would have been extremely offensive to anyone who took God's law seriously. And so you've got this gymnasium in Jerusalem where these Jewish boys are going and they're exercising without any clothing. In addition to that, Jason says, we're going to hold sporting events. And in those sporting events, participants are all going to adopt all the pagan Greek trappings. Again, we might look at that when we say sporting events. It's, we like our football and our baseball. We're waiting for football and baseball to start up again, right? Except Greek sporting events were always tied very closely to Greek religion. They were done in honor of the gods. And there were sacrifices that were carried out along with those things. And so Jason, who's the high priest, is bringing these things in to Judah. At the same time, many Jews adopted Greek names. It's old-fashioned to have a Jewish name that recognizes perhaps the Lord, Jehovah, but we're going to have Greek names. Orthodoxy under Jason began to be viewed as obsolete and old fashioned. That is a familiar, that's something that rings familiar to us, doesn't it? Because very often the young generation, whatever generation that was, it was my generation, it was your generation, it'll be generations after us. We come along when we're young and we say what people have been doing up to now is really obsolete and old fashioned. You don't know how to use an iPhone? That's so old fashioned. What's really interesting is I thought I was pretty new fashioned when I started on Facebook and then my children then told me, oh, Facebook, that is so old fashioned. All the young people are on Twitter and Instagram. Well, under Jason, orthodoxy, that means taking God's law seriously is viewed as obsolete and old-fashioned. We're, we're too modern for that. We don't need to follow God's law. Well, that brings us to our next slide. Antiochus IV 
is interested in expanding his kingdom. He can't really do it much in Asia Minor because you got the, the Romans to worry about, but he can do it in Egypt. And so he's going to wage war against the Ptolemies in Egypt. In 168 BC, Antiochus leads a second invasion. He takes his army once again to Egypt to conquer territory so he can add to his kingdom, so he can feel great that he's a great conqueror. When he gets to Egypt and has done these things, he is met in Egypt by a Roman ambassador. History records his name. His name was Gaius Popilius Linus. And he is the Roman ambassador that has been sent by Rome to the Ptolemaic kingdom in Egypt to kind of make sure that Egypt, well, things stay peaceful in Egypt. And so here comes Antiochus IV. Coming out to meet him is Gaius. Gaius tells him, this is the will of the Roman people that you withdraw from Egypt. If you don't do that, it's going to be considered an act of war against Rome. Well, Antiochus knew what Rome was like. He had spent those years there as a hostage. He is not interested in going to war against Rome. But the story that's told is that Antiochus, when he gets this message, gives the answer, well, I'll think about it. Gaius draws a circle in the sand around him and tells him, don't leave the circle until you've thought about it. Antiochus, who was interested in ruling, and ruling ruthlessly, has his pride destroyed in Egypt. So he withdraws from Egypt with his army, turns loose his frustration on the Jews of Palestine. So what we find going on back in Palestine is that there's political unrest in Jerusalem. We've got these competing parties. Remember what Jason is involved in? There are Jews that are not happy with that. There are people that are vying for control. Who's going to run things? Who's going to have the most power? You have this political unrest. Antiochus comes back from Egypt and he interprets all of this as a rebellion against him. And so he attacks Jerusalem and he turns his soldiers loose to massacre civilians. The temple, the temple is desecrated and it's plundered and the walls of the city are torn down. Totally and completely out of proportion for what's happening in Jerusalem. Let's read about this from the book of 2 Maccabees chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. I might just point out that we're going to be reading a couple of passages this evening from 2 Maccabees. This is Jewish literature of the intertestamental period. It's historical literature. We're going to have an entire class on this Jewish literature later in this series. Uh, not just this book, but a lot of other books as well. Um, but this book, 2 Maccabees, 1 and 2 Maccabees are primary historical source material for this period. So 2 Maccabees chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, when news of what had happened reached the king, he took it to mean that Judea was in revolt. So raging inwardly, he left Egypt and took the city by storm. He commanded his soldiers to cut down relentlessly everyone they met and to kill those who went into their houses. Then there was massacre of young and old, destruction of boys, women, and children, and slaughter of young girls and infants. Within the total of three days, 80,000 were destroyed, 40,000 in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and as many were sold into slavery as were killed. So if you run the numbers there, if you will, 80,000 are destroyed during the period of three days. 40,000 of those are in fighting. Many others are slaughtered as innocent civilians, and then just as many are sold into slavery as were killed. Following this begins a period of terrible persecution of the Jews under the Seleucid monarchy. In 167 BC, forced suppression of Judaism starts. Remember, up until this time, under the Ptolemies, Judaism had been tolerated. Even under Antiochus III, Judaism had been tolerated. Antiochus IV comes along now. We're not going to have any of this. These stubborn Jews are going to have to understand just how wonderful Greek things are. My entire kingdom is going to be united under this. Can't have all of these people worshiping their own gods and worship and having their own culture. So they begin to have it begin, I'm sorry, they begin to have forced suppression of Judaism. The Sabbath. Jewish feasts and circumcision are all forbidden. They're forbidden under pain of death. So Jews are no longer allowed to observe the Sabbath day. Jews are no longer to observe are no longer allowed to observe the feast. They're no longer allowed 
to observe the Day of Atonement. They're no longer allowed to observe the Passover. All of that's been forbidden. Circumcision is forbidden. So Jews are no longer allowed to circumcise their male children on the eighth day after their birth. That's all forbidden. If you circumcise your child, it's under the penalty of death. Going right along with that, recognizing that Judaism is rooted in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Hebrew Scriptures are sought out and destroyed. In addition to that, as if this was not enough, Antiochus orders an altar to Zeus to be set up in the temple. That was referred to by Jews of the period as the abomination of desolation. That terminology should be familiar to you if you're a Bible student from the book of Daniel and from Matthew chapter 24. The Jews use that term terminology to refer at this time to that altar to Zeus, the Greek god that was set up in the temple. As if that weren't enough, Syrian and Macedonian soldiers committed fornication in the temple, violating God's law and violating God's law there in the temple. In addition to all of that, Smaller altars are set up throughout the land in the villages to enforce the worship of Greek gods. It's not just in Jerusalem. It's everywhere where the Jews are living. Let's read again. This is another passage. This is also from the book of 2 Maccabees, chapter 6. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. It's three slides. Not long after this, the king sent an Athenian senator to compel the Jews to forsake the laws of their ancestors and no longer to live by the laws of God. Also to pollute the temple in Jerusalem and to call it the temple of Olympian Zeus and to call the one in Gerizim, that's the Samaritan temple, to call the one in Gerizim the temple of Zeus, the friend of strangers, as did the people who lived in that place. Harsh and utterly grievous was the onslaught of evil, for the temple was filled with debauchery and reveling by the Gentiles who dallied with prostitutes and had intercourse with women within the sacred precincts, and besides brought in things for sacrifice that were unfit. Swine were offered on the altar. Pigs were offered on the altar. The altar was covered with abominable offerings that were forbidden by the laws. People could neither keep the Sabbath nor observe the festivals of their ancestors, nor so much as confess themselves to be Jews. On the monthly celebration of the king's birthday, the Jews were taken under bitter constraint to partake of the sacrifices. And when a festival of Dionysus was celebrated, they were compelled to wear wreaths of ivory and to walk in the procession in honor of Dionysus. Dionysus was a Greek deity, as was Zeus. At the suggestion, verse 8, at the suggestion of the people of Ptolemais, a decree was issued to the neighboring Greek cities that they should adopt the same policy toward the Jews and make them partake of the sacrifices and should kill those who did not choose to change over to Greek customs. One could see, therefore, the misery that had come upon them. For example, two women were brought in for having circumcised their children. They publicly paraded them around the city with their babies hanging at their breasts and then hurled them down headlong from the wall. Others, others who had assembled in the caves nearby in order to observe the seventh day secretly were betrayed to Philip. Philip was the Greek governor of, of Jerusalem and were all burned together because their piety kept them from defending themselves in view of their regard for that most holy day. So on the Sabbath day, they wouldn't fight to defend themselves and they were, well, they were slaughtered. Antiochus IV, Epiphanes, his actions set the stage for the next period of Jewish history, which is the Maccabean Revolt. And it's what we're going to talk about next week. Antiochus IV, though, I want to finish with him before we get uh, to next week's material next week. We need to understand, or we need to remember, at least know, that Antiochus IV died suddenly of disease in 164 BC. And the details of his death are recorded in 2 Maccabees chapter 9. Now, I have to tell you, we're going to read these. They might turn your stomach a little bit. But this is, this is what we read about how this individual died, this man who had waged war against God's people, who had waged war against God's scriptures, who had waged war against God himself, listened to his end. But the all-seeing Lord, the God of Israel, struck him with an incurable and invisible blow. This is the opinion of the writer. It's not inspired. As soon as he stopped speaking, he was seized with a pain in his bowels, for which there was no relief, and with sharp internal tortures, and that very justly, for he had tortured the bowels of others with many and strange inflictions. 
Yet he did not in any way stop his insolence, but was even more filled with arrogance, breathing fire in his rage against the Jews and giving orders to drive even faster. And so it came about that he fell out of his chariot as it was rushing along, and the fall was so hard as to torture every limb of his body. Thus he who only a little while before had thought in his superhuman arrogance that he could command the waves of the sea and had imagined that he could weigh the high mountains in a balance was brought down to earth and carried in a litter, making the power of God manifest to all. And so the ungodly man's body swarmed with worms, and while he was still living in anguish and pain, his flesh rotted away, and because of the stench, the whole army felt revulsion at his decay. 2 Maccabees chapter 9, verses 5-9. through 9. But what Antiochus does is he drives the Jewish people to revolt. And so we're going to talk about that next Thursday night. I appreciate y'all tuning in this evening and listening to this. I just want to pull up this as well uh, to give credit where credit is due. I've used some maps this evening. These maps are courtesy of the mapparchive.com. Every time I use those maps, I'm going to have a slide like that. Recommend you go check them out and have a look at their maps. They've got some really good maps uh, for using in Bible studies and other studies as well next week. Next week on Thursday night, we're going to talk about the Maccabees and Jewish independence. I do appreciate you tuning in and staying with me. When I teach this class in a classroom at the church building, this is three classes. I condense this a lot so that we could get through that material pretty quickly. Next week, we're going to talk about the following period where the Jews are able to reassert their independence for the first time in a very long time. And Antiochus IV and his persecution is what gets that going. Thank you again this evening for tuning in. I hope that this uh, was beneficial to you. We didn't get any questions this evening, but if you've got some questions that you're thinking about, send those to me in a message. You can make a comment uh, on this live stream, and, if, and I'll either answer you privately or we'll try to answer that in the next class. My hope and desire is that everybody listening to this uh, will have a good rest of your evening, a good rest of your week, uh, and I'll wish you, as I usually do when we do this, is I wish you to stay safe and stay well, and may God bless all of you. Thank you again.